Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So welcome to Autos here. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank you for playing. It's good to see you again. So you have your Bibles open to Romans. Those of you who missed the Sabbath school class this morning, it's starting a whole whole thing right now. It's not going to make noise at all. Those of you who missed the Sabbath School class this morning, we started a brand new quarter. And this quarter, the lesson study is going to be on the book of Galatians. Um, the class this morning, the introductory class, was very informative. Um, and I had no idea that this is what the class was going to be, and I'm going to be preaching on Romans. So these uh, messages go hand in hand. This is how God works. And this is how His Holy Spirit works. These two books, I love the book of Romans. The book of Romans has been instrumental in every revival in the history of the church. Amen. If you look at the past, all these great men that we see from Luther have been changed by their study of these two books. And the truths that have been brought out and have been brought to God's people that come from these books. Do you think that it's important for us today to read these books still? Amen. Amen. So listen, are we hoping and wanting and praying for a revival? Amen. Are we hoping for the latter rain to be poured out? Yeah, see, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons why it might not be. Because do we really want it to be poured out? Yes. yes. Okay. For God to pour out that latter rain, it needs to be the desire, the burning desire of God's people. And until that happens, we have to ask ourselves some questions. What I want to do this morning is we're just going to look at Romans chapter 1 as the introduction. And in this one chapter, Paul is so clear of what the gospel actually is. I have asked a lot of people who said that they were followers of Jesus Christ, what is the gospel? And as many people as I've asked, I've got that many different answers. If I was to ask you, could you explain what the gospel is? Do you know what the word gospel means? Good news. Good news, okay? But what is that good news? And this, this good news, when you understand it, is what sparked all of these revivals. And I believe that when we understand it in our day, it will spark another revival. That when we understand what God's gospel, what God's good news really is, and it, not just a head knowledge, but it becomes a heart knowledge, then we'll fall in love with Jesus Christ all over again. And we'll want to do what God has raised us up to do. So, let's look at Romans chapter 1, verse 1, Paul makes his introduction. He tells us who he is, that his name is Paul, and we have this word bondservant. Do you know what that word actually means? Slave. Slave. Very good, Ricky. Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Was Paul an apostle? Was he called the way the others were called? No. 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 And don't you love this, that not only was he called to be an apostle, but he tells you that he was set apart. <clears throat> that his ministry was going to be different than the others. And that he was set apart to do a work for God. Now, what kind of education did Paul have? So. What kind of education did Peter, James, and John have? Okay. There is a reason why God called Paul. Out of that whole group, Paul was a theologian. Now, also, Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament, right? So listen, God in His plan sends Jesus Christ. Christ is on this earth for 33 and a half years. His ministry encompasses how many years? And a half. That's a very short period of time, don't you think? But Christ lays the foundation. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. But Christ is called back to heaven, and now you have this fledgling church. 
And now they have to flesh all this out. And who does God call to bring this truth of what God did in Christ for us? Who did God call? But he calls Paul. And this is what you missed in our class this morning. And that was the history of this man, Paul. What was his name before Paul? Saul. Was he a believer in Jesus Christ? Yeah. yeah. Um, no. no. Before, Not before he was called Paul, was he a believer in no. Jesus Christ? No. Okay, you find out his name was Saul. And Saul was known as the great persecutor. Not the kind of guy you invite over for Sabbath lunch, right? <laughs> So this is Paul. He's a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Why was Paul separated to the gospel of God? Because God was making preparations for his people and for his church. As was brought out in our Sabbath school this morning, the last time the teacher taught, Does God leave his people to be surprised by what's going to happen? Yeah. Or does God make a way to inform them, to teach them, and to prepare them? Okay, so God knew what the church was going to face. God knew the questions that were going to come up. And God raised this man to bring his truth in a much clearer way. And this book of Romans, as Luther stated, is the clearest gospel of them all. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. So listen. What I'm hoping that you guys do is I'm hoping that when you go home, you have this week, I'm hoping that you go and take both of the books of Galatians and the book of Romans and you read them both. And you start to really dig into them because this is the gospel for our day today. God has a message that is in both of these books for his end time people. And if we don't hear it or understand it, then how can we ever be ready for Christ to come again? So Paul is a slave to this gospel. He's set apart for this gospel. And as I stated, Paul is the theologian of the New Testament. Paul is God's chosen vessel. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9. It's the, the book right before it. Romans. Acts chapter 9, let's look at verses 15 and 16. Ray, can you read that for me? Ray, go on. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. This is after his Damascus experience. And he's blind. And he's in this guy's house. And God gives a vision to another man. Do you know what that man's name was? Yeah, yeah. yeah, and he tells him, I want you to go over here. And you're going to go to the, the street called Straight. And go into this house. And uh, Saul's there. And I want you to give him sight back. And what did he say? He was thinking, Lord, do you really know who this guy is? But what did God say? God said that this man is my chosen vessel. And that he's going to see how many things he's going to suffer for my name's sake. And you've got to give Paul credit because did Paul say, Lord, can't you find somebody else? Or once Paul understood the truth of Jesus Christ, he was all in. He was all in. Do you understand what, what made that change? Paul, after he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and for those days after that, as he started to put all of these scriptures together and this picture started to become clear, Paul understood what the gospel really is. That the righteousness does not come from him, does not come from his heritage, does not come from his background, does not come from his law keeping, but this righteousness comes from God himself. Amen. And Paul started to clarify in his mind all of the history 
of Israel. And Paul understood that the battle is not us against these pagan nations. The battle is me and God. And Paul was all in because Paul understood what it meant to die to self. And another scriptural proof that that can happen is in the life of Paul. Because if God was to say to you, Ray, you're my chosen vessel, and I'm going to show you how great things you're going to suffer for my name's sake. Would you think, wow, that's great. No. That's very foreign for us today. But when Paul heard that, Paul was all in because he had a vision of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, that's what you and I need today. We need that vision of Jesus Christ. Continue on in Romans. Paul separated to the gospel of God, verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace... An apostleship for, what's that next word? Obedience. Obedience to what? The faith. Obedience to the faith. Among all nations for his name. Among whom you also are the call of Jesus Christ. Then he writes that this is to all who are in Rome. The love of God called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now listen. It was one thing to be a Christian in Africa. It was another thing to be a Christian in Rome. Do you know why? Because what was Rome in that day? It was the seat of power. And it was the heart of paganism. And now you're a Christian. And what you need to understand that in the Roman culture, they had classes. The Romans were the first class citizens. Jews were considered second class citizens. Do you know what Christians were? They were third class citizens. And there was nothing under them. Okay? This is why Paul goes on to say here, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is why he's telling that to the people in Rome. Because he understood what they were facing and what they were dealing with. That to be a Christian in that city, uh, you, you, definitely, you definitely were a peculiar people. And everybody knew it. And he understood what they were facing, what they would face, and what was to come. And he wanted to build them up in grace and faith. Do you realize this is the only letter that Paul wrote to a church he did not establish himself. So do you understand why it's so important that he wanted to see them? Because he heard of their faith and he wanted to impart to them some spiritual gift. Then he changes and says, no, I want our faith together to build both of us up. Did Paul have a clear understanding of the gospel? Okay? And he wanted to make sure that they were firmly established in this gospel. So he goes on in verse 9 to say, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I have longed to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. See that in verse 11? Do you have a little line after that established? Yes. It means he's changing his thought. He's writing this thought, but then he changes it. Because he's saying, I want to I establish you, but then he changes it. Because he realizes they have a faith in Jesus Christ. And it's heard all over the world. So it goes, that is, that I may be, what's that word? Now, brothers and sisters, this is 
why he wrote in the book of Hebrews that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the custom of some. Why is it important for God's people to come together as a church body? It's because I find encouragement in you and hopefully you find encouragement with me. Amen. But the trials that I go through, that I need help with, I don't go through this myself and I'm sure that whatever I'm going through, you've been through as well. Amen. And if you've come through the other side, then you can help me and vice versa, right? Amen. Also, together, is a rope of one cord stronger than a rope of three cords? All right? So together, we're strong. Together, we can build each other up. One of the downsides to our day and age is I've, I've heard a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't really get a lot out of church. I don't really like the people there. Pastor's boring. I, I watch TV, and, and, and I can listen to the best Adventist pastors from either my television set or my computer. That's true, but that's not what the Bible tells us to do, okay? Because we need each other and we need to come together and share this gospel and this experience together. Amen. So, why do you think Paul was never able to go to Rome? until he gets sent there because he appeals to Caesar. Any ideas? What about the end? <laughs> now think about this. Where was Paul doing his missionary work? Okay? And, and was it Paul who would decide, I want to go here, or was it the Spirit who told him, I want you to go here? So you need to understand that God was using Paul in the area where God wanted Paul to be. Paul wanted to go to other areas you find in the book of Acts, and the Spirit strictly forbade him, right? Yes. So he wants to go to Rome, but he can't. Why? Because God wants him to work in that part of the Middle East. Now you realize Paul was able to make this statement. Now we brought out, not we, excuse me, it was brought out in the Sabbath school class that God wanted to use the nation of Israel to proclaim the gospel, the coming of the Messiah, to the world. Is that right? Amen. And they rejected that, right? So God turns to, instead of a nation, one man. Did that, did that not hit anybody else? He has a nation of a multitude of people, and they reject it, and he turns to one man. And Paul was able to say that he preached the gospel to every creature under heaven before he died. This is why it's so important that we stay faithful to God. Because one person can change the world. If one person has the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, God can do great and marvelous things. Amen? Amen. A whole nation, one God. Who was more successful in actually presenting the gospel to the world? The one guy. Right? The one God. So, he's hindered from going to Rome because God is not ready for him to go there yet. Because he has a work to do somewhere else. And you've got to give Paul credit because Paul stayed faithful to God. Paul didn't say, I don't want to stay here, I want to go here, I'm going to go here. Paul said, Lord, and isn't that the same thing Jesus did? Every morning he got up, did he do his own will, or did he wait for the Spirit to show him what the will of the Father was for that day? So verse 12, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now. Why was he hindered? Because God had a work for him to do somewhere else. That I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. Verse 14, for I am a debtor to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. And I love this verse 16. What does he say? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The question is, what is Paul's definition 
of the gospel of Christ. And that's where the confusion is today. What's that? It is in chapter 5. Okay, but God, or Paul will give you a definition, and then he'll expand on it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for, number one, it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. This is the definition of what the gospel is. Because in this gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall not live by faith. Now, who was Paul's teacher that he said as he was giving his background, his pedigree, his heritage? He said he sat under the feet of this one man. Remember what that man's name is? Okay? So Paul's background and his education was impeccable, right? But when Paul was watching Stephen being stoned, he started to understand that there was something wrong with his religion. There was something wrong with everything he'd been taught. There was something that this man who was dying had that he did not have. Amen. Do you know what that was? It was a righteousness that came from God. Now let me ask you a question. When God said, when Jesus said to Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. What do you think was going through Paul's mind from the day that Stephen was stoned until that day on the road to Damascus? Do you think he was having battles inside his own mind? Yes. Every day? Yeah. What was the battle? This man said his righteousness was impeccable according to the law. Impeccable. But there was something wrong. What was it? In his own words, no flesh can be saved by the deeds of a law. He started to grasp this and understand this. That everything he had lived for, everything he'd been taught, would not produce salvation in him. Because he wasn't righteous enough in the sight of God. And no matter what he did, no matter how many good works that he tried to do, no matter how well he kept the law, it wasn't enough. How many sins does it take to separate you from God for eternity? When Adam fell, was it because he did a bunch of things bad? Or because he disobeyed once? So do you understand that the reason why Adam was righteous before the fall was because he had the spirit of the living God living inside of him. And he was God-oriented. And his thoughts were God-oriented. And he was a selfless creature. Amen. Yes, After the fall, what changed? That glory that came from God, that was their clothing, disappeared. Don't you remember? It says that they were naked and they were afraid. And God asked them, who told you you were naked? How'd they figure it out? Because they realized something changed here. We're not the same as what we were just a few minutes ago. Something changed. And what changed was that selflessness, that God dependence now changed to selfishness and self-dependence. Before that time, did they ever hide from God? Never. But yet when they heard God's voice, what's the first thing they did? Right. They ran and hid. Why? Because they were naked and ashamed. And after Paul saw Stephen and how he gave his defense, how his face shone like an angel, how that before he died, he cried out to God to not charge this sin against those who were stoning him. Now listen. Do you ever read about what it's like to actually be executed that way? It's not something that happened quickly. They start off with small stones, and then they work to bigger ones. Okay? 
So when he cried out for God not to charge the sin against them, and Paul saw that, and it broke his heart because he understood what Stephen had and what he didn't have. He understood that this man, as he said, he saw Christ. And Paul's thinking, how can that be? Christ is a deception. But he couldn't get that image out of his head. And so on that road to Damascus, between that time and this road to Damascus, he's having this internal battle of everything he had been taught and everything he had learned and all that he's seen from these Christians. And God finally comes to him and appears to him. And Christ talks to him. And that changed his life, right? Amen. <clears throat> changed his life. Was he ever the same? Never. Listen, he stated that all that stuff he had in the past, all that pedigree, all that standing in the Sanhedrin and in the nation was nothing but dumb to him Amen. compared to the glory that's found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, that's what he gave up. What are you willing to give up? So, as we continue on, if you read the book of Romans, Martin Luther described this epistle in chapter 1 as the clearest gospel of all. In fact, it was through his understanding of verse 17 of chapter 1 that Luther was delivered from his bondage to legalism and became the leader of the Protestant Reformation. The same doctrine which was expounded by Luther led to the conversion of John Bunyan. You familiar with that guy? Yeah. He wrote Pilgrim's Prog uh, Progress. It was while he was in prison in Bedford, England that he wrote that famous book. In the same way, it was by listening to the preface of Luther's commentary on Romans that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, felt that his heart was strangely warmed on the evening of May 24, 1738, which brought about the birth of that tremendous revival in Britain in the 18th century. Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. It was customary in Paul's day when they wanted to make an emphasis to put things in the negative, so he puts this in the negative to emphasize the positive. Paul is saying that he is not ashamed of the gospel. As I told you, the Romans looked at Christians as third-class citizens. Uh, the Romans themselves were first class, they looked at Jews as second class, and Christians who worship a crucified Savior will look at third class citizens. But Paul is saying, ashamed? Not at all. Why? Because I have come to understand that this, this gospel, is what mankind needs. Now I want you to think about this. Rome was the seat of all power in his day. They conquered every nation that they came up against. But what was the one thing they could never conquer? Self and sin. And this was the message that Paul wanted to bring to Rome. That the gospel was the power to conquer self and to conquer sin. Why? Because this is what righteousness by faith is all about. It's not my righteousness. It's God's righteousness in me, living through me. And because of that, I have peace with God. Isn't that what Paul says? And because I have peace with God, I no longer have to struggle with whether God loves me, whether I'm saved. That's a done deal, as I preached on a couple weeks ago. That's done. Your salvation is secure in Christ. The question is, is are you in Christ? If you are in Christ, then nothing can take you out of Christ. Your salvation is secure, you have peace with God, and now you can go about living as Christ. Amen? Amen. Okay, as I start to draw this to a close. Rome was a very proud city. It boasted of military power, architectural power, economic power. It had all kinds of philosophies being proclaimed in that city. But Paul was saying, I have not come with another blueprint invented by man. 
I am not ashamed of this gospel because it is the power of God. Rome, with all of her pride and all of her success, had failed to do one thing. It failed to conquer sin. And Paul was saying, there is only one power that can conquer sin, and that's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Ashamed of it? Why should I be? It's the only power that can save human beings. As long as he accepts salvation, as long as he believes, whether he be...